be visible. Um, I want to acknowledge that we're on Treaty 6 territory here, the Saskatoon Public Library and um, the location from which I'm tuning in, my Zoom laptop is in the Nutana area of Saskatoon, so Treaty 6 and the traditional homeland of the Métis. Pretty close to round where the Round Prairie settlement was, where we have our newest library branch. That was a, a Métis settlement um, that was once here in, in, in Saskatoon. Yeah, so welcome. Uh, I think that's all of the housekeeping details. If you have any questions during the presentation, you can put them in the chat box. Make sure that you select when you put it in the chat, either all panelists or all panelists and attendees are options. So if you don't want your fellow attendees of the webinar to see what question you're asking, make sure that it's set to all panelists. Uh, the question and answer will follow the presentation. And then I'll also be sharing a survey And, uh, oh, hello, we've got a message in chat. Thank you for coming. If you don't have a mic or a camera, uh, feel free to use the chat for comments as well. If you wanna raise your hand, I can unmute you, uh, but I won't be doing that until the end of the presentation. So uh, we do have a short survey. I'll be sharing that in the chat box if anyone would like to fill that out, it will help us uh, know sort of ab more about you and where you're coming from and uh, what we can do in the future with this program. So I think that's everything. Katya, I'm going to hand it over to you and you can introduce us. Yes, <laughs> thanks Megan. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Sustainability Speaker Series presentation for May. And uh, before I begin with uh, introducing our speaker, I want to say a few words about Saskatchewan Environmental Society. The Saskatchewan Environmental Society has been operating since 1970s on important issues such as sustainable energy and climate solutions, water protection, resources conservation, biodiversity preservation, and reduction of toxic substances in our environment. If you aren't already a member, I encourage you to join SES. You can always find uh, out more information about our diverse projects, activities, and uh, how to get involved by checking out our website at uh, www dot environmental society dot ca if you would like to receive notifications of events in uh, our sustainability speaker series you can send an email to the SES and the uh, address is uh, info i n f o at environmental society dot ca in your email, please uh, specify that uh, you would like to be notified about events uh, in the sustainability speaker series. All right, and um, our speaker this evening is uh, Anne Hawksworth. Anne describes herself as a recovered nuclear chemist. <laughs> For the past several decades, she has been a volunteer and a board member at the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, where much of her recent work has focused on environmental issues around the uranium industry. More broadly, she has represented SES in many environmental impact uh, assessment review processes and has been a member of the MIWOZIN board as well as uh, many other boards and panels, such as Saskatchewan Energy Conservation, 
SASC powers, electrical energy options review panel, the Canadian Environmental Network, and Climate Action Network. Her nuclear chemistry experience was gained at the Sellafield site in England and at the Lawrence Berkeley Lab in California, where she gained a master's degree based on identifying short-lived isotopes of mid-range elements and was part of a multidisciplinary research team experimenting with radiation treatment of hormone disorders. That was long ago, and now she takes time to sit in her garden and think about history, the future, the universe, and the meaning of life. Uh, the title of her presentation today is about small nuclear reactors, if they are part of our future. So please uh, join me in uh, welcoming Anne, and um, I pass it over to Anne and Megan. Okay, uh, thank you, Katja and uh, Megan, and hello, everybody. I uh, just want to say a couple of things before I start. Um, first of all, it's been my experience that people who are critical of the nuclear industry are too often written off as just ill-informed fear mongers who just need to be educated. And this, I believe, is a mistake. Well, there certainly are some people who are simply wary of a technology that they don't understand well. There are many more who, although they may lack scientific credentials, have done a very good job of educating themselves on the issues and who are asking crucial questions. The fact that I have the experience of as it were, getting my hands dirty with highly radioactive materials perhaps may prevent me from being labeled as an ignorant, scary, scaredy cat. But I believe it's important that everybody's concerns need to be taken seriously by those who are making important decisions on our behalf. The issues are not just technical, they're also political and economic and ethical. So I'm here tonight, not as a technical expert, but rather, as I would like to think, a well-informed citizen who, like many others, has some serious questions about the potential new developments in nuclear power in Canada. So what I want to do tonight is to first use information provided by governments and by the promoters of uh, small modular reactors to provide a bit of background at the, about the plans that are afoot in Canada and especially in Saskatchewan to introduce small nuclear reactors into our energy systems. And then I'll briefly describe the characteristics of a few of the specific SMR technologies that are slated for development in this country and that could possibly end up as part of the SAS power system. And after that, I'll talk about some serious concerns about what's being proposed. And finally, a few comments about what I'm guessing is likely to be the outcome in Saskatchewan. And after that, I hope we'll have a bit of time left for some discussion. So, Megan, if you'd put up the uh, slideshow now, please. Uh, let's go back to the first slide. <laughs> there we go. So, okay, so here's our question for the evening. Is small nuclear part of our future in Saskatchewan? Uh, next slide. So let's start by reviewing just what SMRs are. So the S is for small, and by small, they mean less than 300 megawatts capacity electrical, 
which is about one third of the size of current power reactors. The M is for Margiela, and that means that they're built in a factory rather than on site, and that you can join two or three of them together to make up whatever capacity it is that you need. And the R, of course, is for reactor. Although many of us like to insert an N in there, S N N R, to remind us that uh, these are all indeed nuclear reactors. Uh, next slide. So why do we need to talk about SMRs now? Well, first, it's because they're being promoted as a solution to climate change and also as a way to recycle nuclear waste. Both of these are very tempting ideas, but I think their validity is questionable and they do deserve to be challenged. Another reason that people are talking about SMRs a lot now is that the nuclear industry needs rescuing. Uranium markets are in trouble. So the prospect of new markets is very exciting to the Canadian nuclear and uranium industries that have fallen on hard times over the past few years. The demand for our uranium has faltered and major mines have been mothballed. The most recent major nuclear disaster at Fukushima has convinced several jurisdictions that the risks of nuclear power outweigh its benefits and that they should pursue other options. Atomic Energy of Canada Limited, AECL, is a shadow of its former self with responsibility for management and operation of its facilities and sites now delegated to a private consortium of which SNC Lavalin is a major partner. A third reason that we need to talk about this is that the public is being attacked by a very high quality, very persuasive, but somewhat misleading public relations campaign. And I just want to show you a couple of examples uh, from the websites of uh, a couple of companies that are competing for our attention. And let's just note the kind of image that they project of themselves. Uh, the next slide. This company, uh, you'll see their name in the top left hand corner, they call themselves Ultra Safe Nuclear. And in this pristine environment, what's not to love about it? The next slide. Could you put the next one up? Thanks, Megan. Uh, this company, which calls itself Arc Clean Energy, also wants us to associate them with beautiful mountain scenery. They tell us that they are in the race to save the planet. They have solutions. What an attractive concept. In general, the advertising for this highly competitive industry features beautiful scenery, often with lovely wildlife enjoying a pristine environment with reassurances of safety and cheapness. There are, we're told, 150 different potential SMR designs being promoted by different companies, all competing for the attention of governments and the public. So a great deal of money and expertise is being spent on public relations. Incidentally, this company used to be called Arc Nuclear. Very recently, it changed its name to Arc Clean Energy, perhaps to free itself from some negative associations. Uh, the next slide, please. Another reason that we have to be part of the conversation is an economic one. There's a consensus that the only way that SMRs can become economically viable is if they're manufactured in bulk in one location and then shipped to the sites where they would be used. 
So there's a huge international competition to corner the market. And that's leading to extreme time pressure to work through the development stages. Several countries desperately want to be the first to corner the market for what's being portrayed as a profitable new way of using nuclear energy. So there's a race to develop working models that could be demonstrated and then manufactured on a mass basis for export. And Canada has been caught up in this race. We're told that if we could get in ahead of the US, ahead of China, and ahead of Europe, well, gee, maybe we could become the global center for development and manufacture of small reactors. Governments are investing a lot of our money in this gamble. Our federal government has already committed 56 million to New Brunswick's experiments with two untested reactor models. And meanwhile, major serious concerns about safety, economics, waste management, and usefulness are waiting to be addressed. So indeed, we do all need to be able to participate in the conversation. And next slide. So let's just review how SMRs could be used. Basically, uh, all nuclear model that would be mass produced, which of course requires a large market for that particular model. A second finding was that demonstrating the technology in Canada is key to capturing that first mover advantage. So that means we have to move fast if we're going to be able to compete. Thirdly, they say that it will require economic risk sharing among governments, utilities, and industry. And this means lots of taxpayer support that may or may not pay off. Fourthly, the roadmap recognizes that the public have concerns about safety, waste management, and cost. They conclude that knowledge sharing is important. I agree, absolutely. And I think that you and I need to be part of that knowledge sharing. We can't just leave it to the promoters to just tell us what they want us to hear. And finally, the roadmap notes that some modernization of regulation and of our approach to waste management will be necessary. Yes, indeed. There will be new issues to deal with as we start playing with some very unfamiliar technologies. So this roadmap launched the Canadian campaign. Then in late 2019, three provinces, Ontario, New Brunswick, and Saskatchewan, which are the provinces already involved in the nuclear industry, signed a collaboration agreement. Sometime later, Alberta also signed on to the agreement. Uh, next slide. Uh, under this agreement, these provinces commit to working cooperatively to advance the development and deployment of SMRs. They also commit to working together, and I find this interesting, working together to positively influence the federal government to provide a, quote, a clear, unambiguous statement that nuclear energy is a clean technology and is required as part of the climate change solution. And to, quote, make changes as necessary to facilitate the introduction of SMRs. The agreement also includes commitments from the provinces to work together to inform the public about the economic and environmental benefits of nuclear energy and SMRs. And we know that it's just the benefits that they plan to inform us about, not the disbenefits. Then next and most recently, 
we have the publication of Canada's National Action Plan. Uh, next slide. Uh, this action plan was released in February of this year. And the next slide, please. The action plan describes itself as a pan-Canadian effort bringing together key enabling partners in which each partner describes a concrete set of actions that they are taking to seize the opportunity for Canada to lead the world. The plan has 114 chapters, each written by one of the participating organizations, which includes various governments, industries, utilities, nuclear communities, some Aboriginal organizations, some unions, research organizations, and regulatory bodies. Each organization lists in its chapter what it will do to further the development of SMRs. And in total, there are 508 actions listed. So this thing has a ton of momentum. I'll just quickly show you who some of the participants in the action plan are. Uh, next slide. You'll notice some familiar names among these corporate participants. Uh, for example, the Canadian Nuclear Association, the Can Do Owners Group, the Saskatchewan Mining Association, Suncor. And the next slide. Uh, also Hitachi, Ultra Safe Nuclear, uh, Moltex, another nuclear company, uh, the ARC, uh, ARC, so-called clean energy. So the companies that are promoting their own reactor designs are helping to shape Canada's action plan. Next slide. When we look at the government participants, we, we notice the presence of Atomic Energy of Canada Limited and the government of Saskatchewan. Uh, and the next slide, and among the utilities, we notice Sask Power's presence. Um, the next slide, I was a bit uh, curious to see what actions our provincial government has committed to in the action plan. So as you can see here, uh, they include introduction of SMRs in Saskatchewan, which is listed as in progress. Uh, also creation of an enabling regulatory environment for SMRs, also stated to be in progress. And formation of an SMR unit within government, also in progress. The next slide, under, S, under Sask Power's action plan, uh, I was intrigued to see that they say that Indigenous engagement is complete. Well, I think we'll have to ask them just what that engagement consisted of. And while they list SMR demonstration projects as in progress, in fact, in their current public consultation process, while SASPAR talks about SMRs as one possible option to be pursued, they don't anywhere suggest publicly any commitment to hosting demonstration projects. So I'm not sure how seriously to take the action plan. It may be largely a collection of general ideas for possible action rather than an actual plan. The next slide. <clears throat> you may remember that one of the key findings from the Roadmap for Development was that the process for regulating nuclear power would need to be changed. This is because SMRs involve new materials and hazardous new technologies with which our regulatory system has no experience. Already, uh, to make it more convenient for prospective developers of SMRs, 
Our Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission is providing a service called Vendor Design Review. Through this service, companies that are considering applying for licensing of an SMR development can have their preliminary plans reviewed and the Nuclear Safety Commission will try to identify for them any weaknesses in their plans before they go to the effort and expense of preparing a formal license application. And at present, 10 prospective SMR models are being reviewed in this program. The other significant regulatory issue is federal environmental impact assessment. Canada's new Impact Assessment Act exempts from, from assessment um, all those reactors that are smaller than 200 megawatts of thermal capacity, which is about 75 megawatts of electrical capacity, uh, eliminates those if they are on a new site and also uh, exempts those that are smaller than 900 megawatts thermal or 300 megawatts electrical that are built on an existing licensed nuclear site. So this means that the prototype reactors that are to be built on the Darlington and Point La Pro reactor sites won't require federal impact assessments. And this fits with our federal regulators wish to avoid creating barriers to development. We understand that our Saskatchewan regulators are now just beginning to think about how provincial regulation would work. And next slide. This little image just illustrates the sequence of stages that are involved in the development of a new reactor technology. You start with an idea on paper, or more likely on computer, and do some lab scale tests to see if it looks as if it might have some potential. And this is likely the stage that most of the 150 model designs that are floating around are at. If it looks as if your design has some promise, the next stage is to build a prototype. And that's what is planned for Ontario and New Brunswick. This may reveal some design problems that would need to be fixed before you can proceed to building the so-called first of a kind demonstration unit. And so far you've been spending a lot of money in this case, much of it being taxpayers' money. But you hope that this demonstration unit will lead to a wide demand for your product so that you can build a whole lot more of them until you're producing them on a large enough scale that the price per unit can be reduced to what is called the nth of a kind cost. It's an estimate of this magical nth of a kind cost that the promoters use when they talk about SMRs being affordable. Uh, the next slide. This slide shows some of the SMR models that are presently being reviewed under the Nuclear Safety Commission's Vendor Design Review Service. You'll notice that they all plan to build at the existing React sites in Ontario or New Brunswick. This allows them to avoid the federal impact assessment, although they will still require licensing from the Nuclear Safety Commission. For fuel, they all use enriched uranium, which we do not produce in Canada, or plutonium. I'm just going to briefly now describe the key characteristics of some of those models that are under consideration. The next slide. Now, what appears to be the simplest model to introduce is GE Hitachi's 300 megawatt boiling water reactor. 
And this is basically just a smaller version of a much larger power reactor that's been operating in the US for many years. In this design, the fuel bundles are immersed in water, which is heated by the fission reaction to form steam, right, right within the core. This steam is directly transferred without a heat exchanger to a turbine to produce electricity. So it's basically a matter of taking an existing design and shrinking it down. This is one of the models of which Ontario Power Generating is planning to build a prototype at Darlington. The GE Hitachi model would be water cooled so it would need to be located close to a reliable cold water source. It would use low enriched uranium, which as I say, we don't produce in Canada. Our can, can do reactors use natural uranium, which is a mix of mostly uranium 238, which does not undergo fission with a very small amount of the fissionable or fissile U. 235. American reactors use a form of uranium in which the proportion of fissile U-235 has been increased or enriched. So if Canada did decide to go with this model, we'd need to obtain this enriched uranium either from the US uh, or by developing an extremely expensive enrichment facility in Canada. And a note about one of its safety features, the fission reaction is triggered by slow moving neutrons. If the neutrons move too fast, the uranium atoms tend to just absorb them instead of uh, causing the atoms to split and produce energy. So existing power reactors use various techniques to slow down or moderate the neutrons. And of course, you also need to be able to control the actual flow of neutrons so that the fission reaction doesn't get too vigorous. The fission reaction in this GE Hitachi model is controlled by controlling the flow of water through the core. If the flow of water should decrease, the neutron moderation would also decrease. So fewer neutrons would be slowed down to a speed at which they could induce fission. So then the fission would decrease. This suggests then that if the water flow were accidentally interrupted, the fission reaction would slow down and eventually stop. However, it's important to note that the reactor would continue to produce heat from the decay of the fission products, which have already been produced, and from activated materials, even after the fission reaction stops. And this reactor would also produce the traditional highly hazardous waste fuel for which there is no long-term disposal system. The next slide, a different kind of SMR would use liquid sodium metal as a coolant. And this is exemplified by the ARC 100 model, which is one of the models that New Brunswick is investing in. Now using liquid sodium as a coolant is a very funny concept when you think about it. Sodium metal stays in liquid form at temperatures between 98 and 883 degrees centigrade. So for cooling, instead of using cold water, you'd be using a liquid at maybe about 500 degrees centigrade. So this reactor operates at very high temperatures. And it's worth noting that sodium metal isn't an easy material to work with. It reacts with water to produce hydrogen, becoming very hot and catching fire, in which case the hydrogen that's produced becomes explosive. 
Moreover, if liquid sodium metal is exposed to air, it's liable to ignite and the temperature of the burning sodium increases rapidly to over 800 degrees. And you get a fire that's very difficult to extinguish. So in working with sodium metal, you have to be very careful to ensure that it doesn't come in contact with either water or air. Another big difference that this model exemplifies is that it uses a much more highly enriched uranium fuel than the GE Hitachi does. Uh, its fuel would be 15% enriched rather than the three to 5% that's used in current American power reactors. And I'll talk a bit later about the security issues associated with uranium enrichment. Arc Canada's parent company is Advanced Reactor Concepts of Maryland uh, in the USA. They talk of creating an SMR manufacturing plant in New Brunswick eventually, but quote, prefer to make the fuel in the United States. Because of course the enrichment facilities exist there, but not in Canada. The reason that the arc reactor needs this richer fuel is because it's a so-called fast reactor in which you don't moderate the fast, uh, fast neutrons, but instead you actually use them to initiate the conversion of the non-fissile uranium-238 in the fuel to fissile plutonium-239. And I'll talk a bit later about how this works. But what it means is that because the neutrons are moving faster, the fission of U-235, which is a process that likes slow neutrons, is less efficient. So you remedy that by increasing the concentration of U-235 in the fuel. The fast neutron feature and the production of plutonium from uranium is what leads to the concept of a breeder reactor and a reactor that eats its own waste, albeit only a small proportion of its waste. ARC also suggests that it could be fueled with plutonium that's been separated out from used can-do fuel. We then have to confront all the safety and security issues around reprocessing of used fuel and the isolation of plutonium. Uh, the next slide. The suggestion is that the actual reactor would be located just below the Earth's surface, uh, as shown in this image. And the uh, ARC model uses a metal alloy fuel uh, as distinct from the oxide form that's used in traditional reactors. And it claims that it would be able to operate for 20 years without refueling. So this model has several new untested features for which New Brunswick's Bay of Fundy will be the test site. Will it work? No one really knows. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, X Energy uh, is a company that's trying to market another model that would use 15% enriched uranium. In this case, the fuel would be embedded in so-called pebbles. It would operate at 1000 degrees centigrade and would be cooled with helium gas. This is one of the other models that Ontario Power Generating is planning to work on. The next slide. The, uh, this illustration just shows a cross section of those pebbles that contain the fuel. So there are small particles of the highly enriched uranium in the center, and they are surrounded by four layers of coating that are said to be sturdy enough to retain all the fission products as they're produced, including 
the gaseous ones as they are formed. So the, uh, this creates some um, new issues around waste disposal. The next slide. Then there are the molten salt models. The Moltex companies, rather cutely named Stable Salt Waste Burner, is a 300 megawatt fast reactor that would use reprocessed nuclear waste as fuel. That is, it would burn plutonium. Moltex intends to build a model waste burner in New Brunswick. Its fuel would be, get this, a liquid solution of plutonium and other transuranic elements in a molten fluoride salt. The heat transfer would also use molten salt. And we're told that there's apparently still an issue to be resolved about the venting of the highly radioactive fission gases. Uh, next slide. And the last model I'll talk about very briefly is the one that Ontario uh, plans to try out at the Chalk River site close to the Ottawa River. This is described as a five megawatt micromodular reactor. It would operate at a high temperature and be cooled with helium gas and would use molten salt for heat transfer. Its fuel would be 19.75% enriched uranium contained in those pebbles that we talked about earlier. And one of its features uh, is a plan for heat storage in molten salt, which would theoretically allow you to store heat for a few hours and then use that heat later to generate steam to produce electricity. Okay, so much for the specific models that are under consideration for Canadian development. Now, I just want to say a few words about uranium enrichment, given that all the models require either enriched uranium or plutonium as fuel. Uh, next slide. Uh, as I've mentioned, the uranium used in all the small reactors under consideration in Canada would have to be enriched to increase the proportion of the fissile uranium-235. Natural uranium, which is what our can-do reactors use, contains only 0.7% of uranium-235. 0.7%. Low enriched uranium, which is what's used in present American power reactors, contains about 3 to 5% uranium-235. And this is what the GE Hitachi boiling water reactor would use. The ARC and the so-called ultra-safe models would use much more highly enriched uranium, ranging from 15 to 20% in fissile uranium-235 content. And it's interesting that the international community, out of concern about the development of bomb quality uranium, imposed on Iran a limit of 3.67% enrichment. Now, weapons quality requires about 90% enrichment. But this slide from the World Nuclear Association points out that actually once you have enriched to 4%, very little effort is required to further enrich to 90%. And of course, it's causing a lot of international concern because of this, a concern that Iran has disregarded the restriction and is already enriching to 20%. So meanwhile, it's being proposed that we start commercially producing and shipping 20% enriched uranium around North America. Hmm. 
Next slide, please. Some of the models that I've talked about um, discuss recycling, not only their own waste, but also the waste from existing reactors. There are two different approaches here. Let's talk first about models such as that Moltex stable salt waste burner, which plans to fuel itself with plutonium extracted from used can-do fuel from the New Brunswick Point Le Pro reactor. Now this would require establishing a reprocessing plant to separate the plutonium from the fission products and uh, from the uranium in the waste fuel. However, reprocessing will only recover part of the plutonium. So we'd still have a lot of highly hazardous waste to somehow dispose of. Also, once the plutonium is separated from the highly radioactive fission products, it becomes much more accessible for theft. So there are serious security issues to be considered. The other approach is that fast breeder reactor concept that I talked about in the ARC model. Uh, the largest component of uh, uranium fuel is uranium-238. And when a uranium-238 atom is hit by a fast neutron in the reactor, it will tend to absorb the neutron and thus convert the U-238 into a slightly heavier isotope, uranium-239. That uranium-239 then quickly undergoes radioactive beta decay, basically converting a neutron into a proton and thus converting the U-239 atom into an atom of a different element of the same weight and that is Neptunium-239. The Neptunium-239 itself then undergoes further radioactive decay and is transformed into Plutonium-239. So now we have a fissile material that can become reactor fuel. So when they talk about a reactor that consumes its own waste, this is what they're talking about. However, all the fission reactions that are taking place are still producing highly radioactive fission products, some of which are gases, and some of which are quite long-lived. So while you are somewhat reducing the amount of U-238 and transuranic elements, the amount of these fission products accumulating in the fuel actually increases. And although most of these fission products have much shorter half-lives than plutonium, they still need to be kept out of the environment for hundreds of years. So this is not gonna be the magic bullet that solves the dilemma of long-term management of nuclear waste. Okay, so now I just want to summarize what's being proposed in each of the four provinces that are part of the collaboration agreement. Uh, next slide. Ontario Power Generating is working with three grid scale developers, GE Hitachi, Terrestrial Energy, and uh, X Energy, to build experimental models at the Darlington reactor site. Um, also at the Chalk River site, Ontario Power Generating has partnered with UltraSafe Nuclear and they are currently seeking approval to prepare the site for a micromodular reactor demonstration project or a prototype rather, using 20% enriched uranium dissolved in molten salt. Next slide. New Brunswick has really jumped into the SMR race in a big and I would say very risky way. Their government has invested $20 million so far to attract the ARC-100 and the plutonium fueled Multax. They intend to have these models built at the Point Le Pro reactor site. 
The next slide. Uh, Saskatchewan uh, indicates that it is primarily interested in using the 300 megawatt SMRs to add to the grid. And we're relying on Ontario and New Brunswick to do the research and development work as Saskatchewan lacks experience with nuclear power. And as I mentioned, Ontario power generating is going to be trying out three grid scale models. So it's likely that it would be one of these that could possibly end up here. The next slide, uh, Alberta uh, as a late comer to the party has expressed interest in the very small reactors such as the one being proposed for Chalk River. And they see potential for using these reactors to service the oil sands. Next slide. So it's taken me a while to start specifically talking about the things that concern many of us about the proposed development of SMRs, but you've probably picked up most of them along the way. So first, the climate can't wait. It's gonna be a decade or more before we know whether SMRs could realistically be commercialized. And it would be longer before they could begin to have any impact on greenhouse gas reduction. Next slide. Then there's the concern about radioactive wastes. We've already talked about the fact that even reactors that consume a small part of their own waste or that burn plutonium extracted from the used fuel from other reactors still leave us with large quantities of hazardous radioactive wastes. The companies that are promoting SMRs are assuming that Canada will provide a means of looking after that waste. And while Canada's intention is that eventually somewhere, a deep geological disposal facility will be developed, it's anticipated that this would not be available for at least 30 years. The next slide. Security and maintenance issues. Separation of plutonium from used fuel by reprocessing means that the plutonium is no longer somewhat protected from diversion by the highly radioactive fission products with which it was originally mixed. So separated plutonium is much easier to handle than the original waste fuel from which it was extracted. And that makes it more vulnerable to theft. Enriching uranium to 20% purity and beyond also increases the potential for it being used for uh, military purposes because the effort required to refine it to this point from its natural state is most of the total effort needed to get it up to weapons grade. And also we note that all nuclear waste can be used to create so-called dirty bombs. These are regular bombs that are coated with radioactive waste that will contaminate the target area when they explode. As far as maintenance goes, one of the concerns is about reactors in remote locations that would um, probably lack uh, nearby resources and expertise in case of problem situations. Of course, the theory is that they wouldn't require any maintenance, but I'm not sure that we would want to gamble on that. Next slide. Um, about regulation. The roadmap pointed out that the nuclear regulatory system will need redesign. It's gonna to have to deal with new issues such as used fuel reprocessing, reactors operating at very high temperatures, fast neutron reactors, molten salt, molten sodium, and different waste forms. This is gonna take time. And our regulators are anxious not to create barriers to development 
and they're going to be under a good deal of pressure. And I've already mentioned the fact that uh, Canada's new Impact Assessment Act exempts from environmental assessment all those reactors under 75 megawatts electrical on a new site and those smaller than 300 megawatts on an existing licensed site. And so we note that both the Darlington and the Point Baco sites won't require federal impact assessments. But interestingly, the proposal for development of the site at Chalk River for the micromodular reactor was initiated before passage of the new act. And so it's still operating under the old assessment act and will have to undergo environmental assessment. And that process is already underway. Uh, next slide, a few words about economics. The cost estimates that are being suggested by the promoters are unreliable. They're based on that so-called nth of a kind concept that I talked about earlier. The nth of a kind cost refers to the estimated cost once you've done all the development work and have successfully marketed enough units that you are mass producing them. So the assumption of the industry is that the lost economy of scale associated with building a small reactor rather than a big one will be overcome by mass production of a single small model. Meanwhile, an attempt to get to that position would require massive, long-term, risky government investment. And this at a time when there are other heavy priorities for government spending. Next slide. And finally, misleading messaging. I'm concerned that the public and our governments are being misled by a slick sales job and unrealistic projections. I think we've seen that SMRs won't get rid of nuclear wastes. SMRs are not inherently safe. They are largely untested. And SMRs are not nearly ready to impact greenhouse gas emissions. So we might well wonder why our governments are buying into this concept so enthusiastically. I've even heard cynics suggest that it may be just a way of delaying taking effective action on climate change. I doubt if this is a conscious policy, but I do think that we need to realize that the dollars our governments are spending gambling on this rather problematical technology is money that could be much more effectively spent on developing the known safe ways of reducing the greenhouse gas emissions from electricity uh, generation. So the question we started with was, is small nuclear part of our future in Saskatchewan? My response would be that there certainly is a great deal of pressure moving us in that direction. But I'm not really convinced that it's going to actually work out that way. Uh, next slide, please. First, Saskatchewan is a follower, not a leader in this business. And I really don't think anything significant is likely to happen here until many years of development, testing and refinement have taken place elsewhere. Secondly, most economic benefits and jobs associated with, with an SMR industry would not happen in Saskatchewan. The chances of having a factory to produce SMRs in bulk for distribution to a global market being located in Saskatchewan, well, I would think those chances are virtually zero. So I don't think there are big economic advantages uh, in prospects here. 
Thirdly, um, I'm guessing that if our province were to choose to buy SMRs to become part of the SAS power grid, that the most likely choice would be the GE Hitachi boiling water model. And I say this because it's the least innovative model and would thus probably be able to move through the approval and licensing stages faster than the models that involve more speculated technological features. And this model, as I mentioned, would produce the traditional nuclear wastes for which Canada has no long-term management system in place and won't do so for several decades. And fourthly, I expect that the economics will create a significant barrier to commercial development of small reactors generally. Cost estimates are based on the assumption that you've already built a whole lot of units of a particular model and worked out all the kinks in the process and probably have robots building them in a mass production facility. Until or unless the industry develops to this stage, it's going to require a great deal of public spending, which I think is probably going to be hard to justify in the current economic scenario. And meanwhile, while all this is going on, I anticipate that other more effective options are likely to take over the market. So that's the end of my presentation. Uh, I think our last slide shows how to contact the Environmental Society.